Hello. How's it going? We're doing the midterm review this week, right? That's what I thought we were doing, but I just want to make sure because I know I've had some issues with the schedule in the past. And I am going to just quick move myself for a couple of before we start. Um, and we'll get started as soon as we get back. Okay, I am back. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, okay. Um, it is midterm review, correct? We're just doing midterm stuff this week, prepping for that, making sure we're all on the right track. Awesome, okay. Um, basically the way that I do this is I just kind of open up the floor. You're the only one in here right now. So it's really whatever you want this to be. We can talk about whatever you're having the most difficulty with, whatever you want to talk about, whatever types of practice problems you want to do. It's all up to you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Perfect. Um, I did have a couple questions regarding the practice midterm that no matter how hard I've tried, I just cannot understand. Okay, um, let me pull that up then. Um, give me just a couple of seconds. I also dropped my pen. I'm sorry. Um, no, no problem. I've had a crazy like last 15 minutes, so <laughs> you know how it goes. There are some 15 minutes of your life days. Yeah, totally. If you need to take a minute, that's cool. No worries. No, it's good. Um, okay. Let me find the practice term. Uh, okay. This is not the right time. Um, so this is the online practice midterm or one of the old exams? Uh, this is the online practice midterm. It was my first attempt. I'm going to take my second attempt uh, this afternoon. Okay. Um, my guess is that they're going to scramble the questions. What question is it that you wanted? I've got a few of them, but I don't want to monopolize if <laughs> you know what I mean. You're the only one here right now. So, oh, okay. Yeah, um, it's literally whatever you want. Um, do you want me just to put them up or um, just um, send them over to you? What numbers are they? Let's start with. And I might be able to have them. 
the one I have, the very first question I have is on question four on my practice midterm, which is given two functions, f of x comma g of x and their derivatives, f prime and g prime, only one of the following statements is true. Which one is it? Okay. Um, let me see what it I just about said this one and then I realized you couldn't see that. Okay, this. Yes. Yes, that's the one. Awesome. Okay. So given two functions and their derivative, uh, only one of the statements is true. Uh, which is it? So if f of x is greater than g of x on an interval, then f prime of x is greater than g prime of x on an interval. If f prime of x is greater than g prime of x uh, on an interval, then f of x is greater than g of x. If f prime is equal to g prime, then f is equal to g. If f prime is equal to 3g prime, then f is equal to 3g. And if f is equal to g, then f prime is equal to g prime. OK. This is kind of a wonky question. All right. I don't know what the answer is right off the bat, so let's kind of puzzle this through. Um, the way that I would kind of approach, or how about you tell me how you approach this? Let's start with that. What was your thought process going through this? Um, I kind of had trouble struggling with um, the, really the first step. When I look at it, I see that it says given two functions and mm -hmm. their derivatives are both positive. Um, I guess, well, the answer that I put was F prime is greater than G prime on the interval then F of X is greater than G prime. Because my thought was that if the slope is greater for F than it is for G, then um, prime, then um, F would be higher on that interval than G. Um, the way that I would think about this is actually I would try to set up like functions that would disprove that, if that makes sense. It does. Like, I would set up a function maybe that looks like this, where um, I'm going to call, I'm going to color code it as best I can in the snipping tool. I'm going to call F and F prime uh, red and G and G prime blue. Um, if I have the function f, which looks, let's see, we said that f prime is greater than g prime. If I have the function f that looks like this, and this is the interval that I care about, let's say, um, and then I have the function uh, g that looks like this, then f prime is greater than g prime, right? If this is the function f of x, then f prime of x is a positive number. Are you um, doing this based off of what the choices are at the bottom? I'm just trying to follow. Um, I am just looking at what this is, and I'm trying to disprove it, essentially. Ah, uh, OK. Yeah. So I'm thinking, is there a scenario that I can envision where if I have an F prime that is greater than a G prime, in this case, I have F prime is greater than G prime. Oops. I did them one on top of another. Um, well, does that, that, I, does that mean that F prime is greater than zero when it says that F prime is greater than G prime? Um, no. Um, the greater than, is just gonna to refer to like comparing the two and it doesn't involve comparing them to zero. So there's no way to tell if both of these are positive, both of them are negative, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. This is just like the best way that it, like, I like thought, okay, so I'm gonna, obviously I'm gonna have one that's positive and one that's negative. 
and then on like this interval here from like zero to like, I don't know, it's like one maybe, this interval, I have F that is negative, but its derivative is positive. And then I have G that has a negative derivative. So G prime is less than F prime, but G is greater than F. The only way that the slope could be f prime could be greater than g prime is if g prime was negative. No, this is not the only case. Um, basically, this is say this question is saying, I have like only one of these statements is true, and the method that I think that I would try to approach this, or that I am, because I don't know what the answer to this is. Um, the method that I would approach it with is to say, okay, if one of these is true, then everything else must be false can I come up with a scenario that proves this is false so that I can cross it off the list, it can't be true, and then I can move on to the next one. And I would just like methodically go through and say, is this possible? If it is, then this is. Because, okay, essentially, I'm trying to explain this in like a different way than some, like the way that I already have. Um, essentially what this is saying is that if f prime of x is greater than g prime of x, then f is greater than g. Okay, right? So I have a condition and I have a then statement. So my strategy is to say, if this is true, does this have to be true? So I set up a scenario where f prime is greater than g prime, right? So here f prime is greater than g prime. But f is less than g. So this contradicts the statement if then, because if and then this is not the original case. So it's kind of like a logic problem in that I'm just trying to disprove these statements one by one. Because the idea is, is a, I'm looking for the one that I can't disprove because it's true. Okay. Um, so um, when you put the graphs f of x and g of x um, in blue and red, would it, does it matter if it's above or below the x-axis? I'm just trying to build my logic. Yeah, so um, let, let me erase this and let me build this again. And I'm actually going to have you like walk me through building it um, okay. because I think that that might be helpful um, if I can erase all of this. Um, so I'm going to set this up a little bit differently. Because my first goal here is, you, you picked this one, right? That I highlighted in the blue? Uh, and it turned out not to be right? Um, the, let's see, G of X greater. Yep, that's the one. Sorry, I just okay. had to make sure. Oh, I know what the answer is now. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've been like looking through this, and I'm like, oh, gosh. Do I really know what's going on here? I, I can't figure out. Okay, everything's fine. Um, okay, so basically, tell me what this is saying. Like, you can just read it out, but like, the they, the problem or the answer. This, like, what is what statement is this answer like telling me? It says that the slope of f is greater than the slope of g. And to me, that would mean that um, it could go either way. It could be that the slope of f is positive and the slope of g is negative, or the slope of f is, you know, it could be 21 and the slope of g could just be 20. Whatever the case may be, the slope of f is always greater. Yes. Awesome. I keep losing my uh, pen and then not being able to find it. Okay, so this is, for instance, um, positive 
versus negative. Um, and then again, we could do, uh, you know, 21 and I'm going to do something a little bit less than 21 just to like make it like a little more obvious and then, you know, like mm -hmm. three. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have this set up in this way that there, there are two kind of scenarios that we can envision. We could also say this is you know, negative three and negative 21. But the idea is, as you said, the slope of F is greater than the slope of G. So I'm going to try to graph this scenario. So the slope of F, sorry, I don't like using the scenario. So <laughs> um, the slope of F, what do you, what do you kind of want me to draw here for F to have a positive slope? Um, just a, a line. And that increases from left to right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and G? Um, G would be the same, except it wouldn't be as steep. Okay. okay. I'm actually going to draw two G lines that are exactly the same, except they have different y-axes. Okay. Right? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to name them uh, G, and I'll call this one H, actually, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um. And there's F. So if we're looking at H, um, what can we say about F and H? We can say that F O we can say that uh, F prime of X is greater than or less than H prime. Mm -hmm. Greater than, less than. Uh, it's greater than. Um, and what can we say about F on, let's just say, this interval? Just what we drew, mm -hmm. essentially. So from X is equal to 0 to X is equal to, I don't know, we'll call that 5. So mm -hmm. we only care about the stuff between 0 and 5. Okay. Is the actual function, like, is F of 1 greater than or less than F or H of 1? Um, F of one would be greater than H of one. Yep. And that's because it's crossing the X axis at a lower interval, a lower number than what H is. Essentially. Yeah. So H is going to grow slower and it's set like initially below. Um, and so for any point along this interval that you say, I'm taking F of this point, for instance, we'll call it F of X then that is going to be greater than any point h of x along the same interval, given that those x's are the same. So this is saying that I have a point here and I have a point here, and this is going to be uh, f of x1, and this is going to be h of x1. F is always going to be greater than H comparatively, right? Yes. So if I were to set up this scenario, this statement, if um, the slope of F is greater than um, the slope of G, then F is greater than G, what I've just said here would support this. Mm -hmm. But if I have this condition up here with G, let's compare now. Um, 
f prime of x versus g prime of x. Which of these slopes is larger? The slope for f prime. Yes. But if this is x1, we'll just call this uh, x1, um, how does f of x1 compare to g of x1? g would be greater than f. Yes. And if that's the case, um, g of x1 is greater than f of x1. Um, we can go on to say that for any f in this interval, uh, f of x will be less than g of x. So what I have done here is I've created a very specific example. Mm -hmm. But the point of this example is not to say that like, okay, so I found out for this specific scenario, now I need to think about every other scenario on the planet. I only need to disprove this statement once. And as long as I've disproved it once, then it can't be right. Okay. It has to be either true or it is false because it's, it's making a statement. It's saying that if this is the, like, the situation, then this is the situation. Um, I'm actually going to move back to Zoom if that's okay, um, and just keep a note with this um, as we kind of work through, mm -hmm. um, just for the sake of my sanity. Um, <laughs> so let me pop back into the Zoom whiteboard. Okay, so does this kind of make more sense? Uh, it does. Um, so it just has to be done one time and then I can apply the rest of the different answers to it to see which one would be true? Well, you're gonna have to do create a scenario for each different like scenario gotcha. actually. So basically, what I would do is I would go through and I would say, okay, so here I have f of x is greater than g of x, um, then f prime of x is greater than g prime of x. Um, this is either true or false. How can I show that it is false? I can make a graph where um, f prime of x is greater than g of x, so I'll call this f of x, and I'll call this g of x. Mm -hmm. And here, g prime of x is greater than f prime of x. So I've created a graph in which g prime of x is greater than f prime of x, but f is greater than g. Thus, this must be false. It, can, it has to be true in all scenarios, or it is not true. Okay. Okay. So, I would just kind of work through and do all of those. So, part one, that was the one that we just did. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to write it down. And that on an interval thing is just specifying that we're comparing, like, apples to apples here. We're looking at the same x values. Um, we're not like, you know, I don't know, doing something crazy with that. Um, yeah. we're just looking at the right thing. Okay. Part three. Here we have, um, actually let's do four first, where we have F prime of X is equal to three g prime um then f prime f of x is equal to 3 g of x can you think of a graph that will show that this isn't true this is kind of like what we just did actually in that graph that you had set up um does the three in front of the g just means that it's a vertical shift up or it's not a starting? vertical shift it's a vertical stretch so like I, if this is a slope of one, mm -hmm. then this is a slope of three. Or 
or no, it's the opposite. Um, this is, sorry. Oh, that's um, okay. This is a slope of three. So if g of x is equal to one, then f of x is equal to three times g of x, which is equal to three. Oh, okay. So I could set up something that looks like this, where I have f of x um, and the slope of f of x is equal to three. And I could set up uh, this, which is g of x, and the slope of g of x is equal to one. Thus, f prime of x is equal to uh, three times g prime of x. So I've established that that is the case in this graph that I drew, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, for instance, at this point, f prime of x is, or f of x is equal to zero. And g prime of x, or g of x, excuse me, is greater than that. Right? Mm -hmm. So if g prime of x is greater than f of x, and is not, in fact, as, like, number four posited, uh, equal to three time, or one third of f of x, essentially, 3g is equal to f, of, is equal to f, then this full statement will be false. Does that, does that make sense? Is that like followable? Um, it's like a train of logic. So I just want to make sure I understand. Um, where it's f prime of x is three because it's x times um, whatever the three is in front of the g. Yeah. And then so this the is, yeah, this is me saying that what if g prime is equal to one, then f prime would be equal to three times that, so it's three. Okay. Um, if g prime were equal to two, what would f prime be? Uh, it would be six. Yep. So I've just made a specific scenario that fulfills all of my requirements. In this because. case, this is my only requirement, but it doesn't fulfill the rest of the state. Gotcha. So I've shown that number four is not a valid statement. That leaves us with number three and number five, which I think are the more interesting ones here. One of these is correct, um, because we've shown that, uh, I guess that would be A, B, and D are not. So this is C and E. Um, that leaves us with F prime of X is equal to G prime of X. Then F of X is equal to G of X. And if f of x is equal to g of x, then f prime of x is equal to g prime of x. What's the difference between the two? Um, in one scenario, we're starting with a derivative. And then in the other scenario, we're starting with the initial equation. And it's kind of like, is this going to work backwards or forwards, essentially? OK. Um, so, which one would you like to start to try to prove wrong? Uh, start with three. Okay. Uh, and then with that, I would draw two lines on an interval with that have the same slope. Okay. And it wouldn't matter where they are because they have the same slope. Awesome. And then so I guess, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's fine. Um, the red one I would say is F, and the green one I would say is G. So that would be true because their slopes are equal. And then F is equal to G, which I guess could be true because you could just overlay them. Does it? It doesn't okay. say. I don't know. 
no, no, you're, you're onto something. It's just a matter of logic, right? Yeah. Could be true, but you'd have to overlay them. But what have you created in this number three graph? You have created a graph that fulfills my requirement that F prime is equal to G prime. Mm -hmm. But you've shown that F of X does not always have to equal G of X. Oh, okay. You've shown that this is false. Now, what's, what can I draw to prove that five is true? Or what can I draw to prove it's false? Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, so two lines, if they're equal to each other, they would be equal in the same place, and then they would have the same slope. Exactly. Because you can't move them any which way if they're equal to each other. Exactly. Oh, that's the part I was missing. Yep. I didn't... I did not equate that to different scenarios with the same set of conditions. I, it took me a hot minute of just staring <laughs> at this problem to find that out. So basically what they're saying is that in this function, there is a period of time where f of x is equal to g of x. And in that period of time, they are essentially the same function and thus they will be behaving and changing in the same way. That makes complete logical sense. So. Oh, thank you. That is how I would have approached that problem. <laughs> that makes complete <laughs> sense. I could just looking at it now, I can completely understand and see. It's just like it's a clicking moment, but yeah, awesome. Okay, what were the other problems that you had issues with on the practice exam? The other one is over a five-year period, the population of moose in a wildlife refuge is monitored, and then it gives the function p equals f of t, and it says it has a negative first derivative and a positive second derivative throughout the five-year period. Awesome. Okay, so here we have a population, which is equal to f of t, and I hate that. I don't know why they couldn't just say p of t. Um, we're going to leave it as f of t. I just think it's stupid. <laughs> okay. I'm that is I'm my opinion. <laughs> um, if anyone asks. Uh, okay. So we my have the function <laughs> f of t. Um, and we know that f prime of t is negative. And we know that f double prime of t, our second derivative, is Positive. Um, so which of the following statements is correct? Um, before we do that, um, let's just quickly establish what these two things mean. Um, what does it mean for f prime to be negative? Well, it just means that the slope is negative and f double prime is the concavity and it says it's positive, mm -hmm. so it's concave up. Oh, crap. That it's concave up is um, just a, like a U, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that is concave up. Okay. And it says throughout the five-year period. Mm -hmm. So I graphed it. I just made a quick graph, but I wasn't sure where to put, where exactly to put the um, parabola because the critical point in the parabola because it says throughout the five-year period. Yep. Um, so you're not actually going to have like a min to that. Okay. Um, just because it's going to stay one thing throughout the entire time. Um, in terms of moose, what is the same? Saying that the population is decreasing, but then at some point it recovers and starts going in a positive direction and starts to increase again. But does it say that? This uh, concave up thing is really helpful if you're looking at a graph, but mm -hmm. for this, I would actually think about this in terms of a population and of terms of rate of change. So a second derivative is a rate of change of a rate of change. So this is a rate of change of a negative rate of change, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the rate of change of f prime of t 
is positive. Um, if I were to like think about, um, I'm going to hypothesize or not hypothesize, I'm going to posit two graphs. I'm going to say I have a graph that looks like this. So it looks like that. Mm -hmm. And then I have a graph that looks like this. And you can clearly see that there's a concavity to this, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is the difference between these two graphs? These are both, for both of these, right? Mm -hmm. They both have a negative first derivative. But this one is becoming less and less negative. Mm -hmm. We're coming back to the more and more negative versus less and less negative thing. Mm -hmm. Eventually approaching zero. And then in here, we're getting more and more negative. Which of these has a positive second derivative? The green one, the one on the left. Yep. And then this one, as it's getting more and more negative, is going to be a negative second derivative. So we're going to have a graph that doesn't necessarily come back up, but is going to be getting less and less negative. And that's kind of what we want to think about. So the rate of change. Um, So, I'm going to phrase it as less and less negative. Uh -huh. Now let's think about moose. Which of these following statements is correct? Also, I'm going to sketch out that graph that we just drew, where we have moose and we have less moose. But it's concave up, and our rate of change is negative. T, um, the population fell during the five-year period, and it fell more during the last year than it did during the first year. Mm -hmm. so what is that comparing? That is comparing the first year change to the last year change. I'm going to blow up this. I didn't think I was going to use this graph, and then I immediately used that graph. So I'm going to make the graph bigger. So talk to me about this first statement. Uh, the, the which first statement? The population fell during the five-year period, and it fell more during the last year than it did during the first year. Um, so I guess there's two statements. The population fell during the five-year period, but it fell less in the final year than it did in the first year. It looks like it stabilized. Can you just repeat that? Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, the population fell during the five-year period. So over yes. the five-year period, it did decrease. Um, but in the final year, it fell less than it did in the first year. Yes. It looked like there was a pretty steep decline in the first year. So, is this first statement A, true or false? Uh, true. Read A again. The population fell during the five-year period. I guess you might have it in a different order. Yeah, I think they uh, randomized They probably did scramble on it. Um, mine has it saying that it fell more during the last year than it did in the first year, which is false, because it fell more in first year then last. So for me, that would be problem or answer C. But <clears throat> um, just for like sake of going through all of this, um, the population was initially declining, but it began increasing by the end of the five-year period. 
what tells us that that's not true? Um, the concavity, I guess, because it, it mm -hmm. looks like it's just stabilizing right at the end of the five-year period, but we don't know it's, where it's going, if it's going to go back down or if it's going to go back up. That's not concavity, though, is it? What is it specifically that tells us that we are decreasing? The first derivative? Yes. So we know that, um, so for me, this is B. Um, initially declining. Uh, then increasing. Not true. Because um, the first derivative is negative all five years. So it's declining all five years, which would also suggest that the answer is the population rose during the five-year period and the, pop the two ones that start with the population rose during the five-year period. Um, I have to read them all out because the first statement, first clause in that phrase is just wrong Incorrect. because we know that it's declining. So the way that I would do this is I would first look at the first derivative. I would go through and I'd eliminate for me what are B, D, and E because I know that it doesn't increase ever. So the population doesn't rise during the first five year period and the population is always declining. And then the second part of that phrase is going to be uh, how is it declining? Is it becoming more and more negative or less and less negative? And that's what the second derivative tells us. Which would be less and less negative. Yes. Does that make a little bit more sense? That makes a lot more sense. I was thinking straight concavity on both sides instead of just one aspect of concavity. Yep. So now I have a better yeah. logic. Concavity is really easy to envision with a parabola, but it's like hard to keep thinking that way because it is also important to recognize that like you can have concavity even if it is always decreasing or increasing. You don't need yeah. to have a min max. So yeah. Um, cool. I I do, do have a couple more, but I don't know what your time constraints are. Um, I have essentially another twenty minutes. Okay. So. Um, what really threw me was this the revenue one where it says for cute units of a product and manufacturer's cost in dollars and revenue, and that gives me four hundred. Well, C prime. No, that's just C, 400 equals 1,200, and R, 400 equals 13,500. Okay, so for Q units of a product, the manufacturer's cost is C of Q dollars, and the revenue is R of Q dollars. Um, we know things that we know, C of 400, is equal to 12,000 and R of 400 is equal to uh, 13,500. Um, we also know that marginal cost and marginal what marginal cost and marginal revenue are equal to. Um, what is another way for me to write marginal cost? Instead of writing MC, what can I write? Um, the cost to produce a unit over 400, or 400, each unit over 400. That's true. That is what marginal cost is, but I'm going to write it as C prime of Q, or rather C prime of 400 is equal to 25, because marginal cost is just the derivative of the function, essentially. Ah. Uh. So I'm going to write it like this because I don't like using MC and MR when I could just use language that I'm familiar with. Um, I know what to do with a derivative. For me, at least, I'm not a business person. I balk at MC and MR. <laughs> but I'm much more comfortable putting it in terms of derivative, which I know how to work with. Um, so 
Um, they want to estimate the change in profit if production is increased from 400 to 401 units. So, what are we looking at? The rate of change? Mm -hmm. Of? Of, uh, I don't know if I'll say this right, but the rate of change from the 400th unit to the 401st unit? Yep. So we're comparing. Of what function? When you say what function? Um, just read that statement for me again. Estimate, starting with estimate. Oh, estimate the change in the profit of, excuse me, estimate the change in the profit if you production. Can stop there. Estimate the change in profit. So we're looking for the rate of change of profit. Right? Yeah, does it matter if it's the relative rate of change or the average rate of change? Um, we don't need either of those. The relative rate of change, I think, is going to screw us up a lot. Okay. Rel like, this is not a relative rate of change problem. Um, the average rate of change would be much harder to calculate with the information that we have than the instantaneous rate of change. Ah. So we're just going to go ahead and find the instantaneous rate of change. Um, profit. What is profit? How can I, if I have a function P of Q, what is it equal to? Um, it is equal to RQ. Is it? What's the difference between profit and revenue? Oh, I just said that with my mic off. I'm sorry. Um, oh, no, you're good. The difference in the cost of what it costs to produce versus what the revenue would be generated? Yes. So revenue is before cost. So how would I incorporate cost into this equation? Can you say that again? I didn't follow. I'm um, sorry. Where I, I want to include cost in my calculation of profit, right? Mm-hmm. Because profit depends not only just on revenue, but also on how much money that we spend. Where where can I put the cost? So our profit is going to be whatever money we make minus whatever we spent to get there. Does that make sense? That makes sense. So. Um, then... I'm going to take this one more step and I'm going to say we have something called marginal profit. I don't think this is what the book does. This is what I do. Um, and I can show you how to get here. I think it would stress you out, but <laughs> um, it's basically just implicit differentiation with respect to Q. Um, so I'm writing it like this because I'm, sure this is how the book would want me to, but I would rather, if I can, write it like this, which is the implicit differentiation, essentially. Gotcha. Actually, you could do this. You could do this piece of cake. Um, oh, and I erased everything. Um, basically what we're doing here is we're just taking the derivative with respect to Q. I'm just saying this is D, D, Q, and D, D, Q on both sides. So I get P prime or D, P, D, Q, and then I get D, R, D, Q, R prime minus, uh, C prime, right? It's just taken the derivative, essentially, of this P minus is equal to R minus Q. 
But now I've set myself up in a scenario where, what do I have? In the orange, I have P prime. What is P prime conceptually speaking? The profit. So it would be the revenue minus the profit, which would be, um, no. Nope. Hang on, what is P prime conceptually speaking? Profit is just P. Oh, the P prime would be um, the rate of change, the slope. Mm -hmm. That's what I want, right? We want the rate of change of profit. That's what we said. That's what we want. We got that. And what do we have? We have R prime and we have C prime, right? Mm -hmm. So I would just put these in. So what is our change in profit? Which would be seven. And because it's positive, it would be um, an increase. Yes. You don't even need to worry about what R and C actually are. So they're just throwing a bunch to try to confuse you. A bunch um, of info. If you don't use marginal profit, um, you would have to say, okay, so C is 12,025 uh, and R is 13,532. And then I have to subtract 13,000, you know, like do that whole thing and then find out what the difference is. But using marginal profit in the exact same way you would marginal revenue and marginal cost, um, you end up with this much faster. So you could use those if you really wanted to go the long way around. But no, I, not no. preferably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that mm. makes that makes so much more sense. I did not understand that at all, and it's so good. easy. A lot of this is just parsing through what exactly is it that they want from you, and then what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to estimate the change in profit? Do you want a rate of change? Do you want a profit? What is profit? Fundamentally, revenue minus cost. Take the derivative of that, and you end up with the marginal profit is equal to marginal revenue minus cost. Marginal cost. And that's an easy equation you can use to solve, essentially. That's very easy. So, yeah. Um, do you have time for one more? Or for do you have sure. to go? Nope, let's do it. Um, it says the graph of f of x is shown to figure um, below, calculate the average rate of change um, on the interval zero, six. I got that wrong, but I think it's just, um, I think f, f of x, well, I guess two values between the, I guess it's just um, y, oh my God, I'm trying to say it and I can't think of it. Just saying the average rate of change, which is, um, f of x minus g of x and then f minus g. Do we, okay, where did g of x come from? I thought that's what the formula was. Um, I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is an average rate of change? When I think of an average rate of change, what am I thinking of? It's just what the difference in the y value is over the difference in the x value. Yes. It's just... So Talk to me about what that is. Um, so in the interval of zero, six, the Y value is three at zero. And then at six, the Y value is a half, one half. Mm -hmm. And then the X value on that interval is zero. And then the, the second X value would be six. I don't know why I picked the colors I did. That purple is just really getting me now. <laughs> like, that was a bad call. <laughs> oh, no, it's totally fine. It's just, purple just got me. What was I thinking? Um, okay, so this is going to be 2.5 over negative 6. So we can call that negative 5 over 12. 
the 2.5, that's five over two if two is divided into five? Um, I just said this is gonna be times, I'm like times two and times two. Gotcha. That looks like squared, but it's meant to be times times two, if that makes sense. Um, because I'm allowed to do that if I have a function or if I have a number that's like 2.5 over six, then I'm gonna multiply it by two over two, which is just one. So that'll be five over 12, negative five. How would I draw this on the graph? Uh, what is uh, this? Delta Y over Delta X? Just the, the, the change? Yep, it's a slope of a line. Of a secant line. So, yep. I got lost with uh, two and a half times two. I know, th uh, um, I got, I completely got lost. You're good. Um, so basically, this is correct. 2.5 over negative six. But I don't want to do that because I don't want to have decimal places. I got um, um, five over two over negative six. Is that right? You get? Oh, yes. That is also fine. Um, um, so this is 5 oh, over 2. Okay. That makes over sense. And that's how you got the 5 over 12. Yeah. So this, this is 5 over 2, right? 5 over 2 divided by um, negative 6. So that would be divided by negative six over one, right? Yeah, which would be multiplied um, by negative one over six. Which would be five over 12, negative five over 12. Yeah. Okay, that makes complete sense. Okay, for I'm sure. overthinking that. And if you have time for one more, if not, it's totally cool. Yep, no, let's do it. Um, the one I have is referring to the plots f of x and g of x below, calculate um, f of g x um, at five is the limit. So it's the two different graphs. And it looks like it's a composite function. It is indeed a composite function. So that would be um, formula f prime times g, or f prime times d times the derivative of g. So how do you, oh, what was that? How do you know um, when it's a composite function versus having to use the product rule? Because those two really throw me off. Because to me, it looks like multiply. How many x's do I have in this function? Two x's. This is, ignore that. How many x's do I have in this right here? This is my Just function. one? Oh, yes. I guess just one. So I have f of something of x. So yeah. if I were to write this as, you know, x squared plus one to the third, right? Mm -hmm. I would have f is equal to g cubed, g is equal to x squared plus one. Versus if I have something like this, if I have uh, f of x times g of x, I will have x, uh, x cubed times x squared plus one. So how many x's do I have in this like setup? You got two. I have a function and it's times a function. And here, I am enacting the work of a function upon another function. So if it's f times g, that means that there's two functions in there. Yes. And then if it's f prime g, a composite function times g, it just means that there's one x in there. Essentially. It, it's not that there's just one x. Like, you can have, like functions that are both product rule and chain rule, but like a good rule of thumb is identify where your function is. Like, um, 
book because I just have like tables and tables and functions that I can yeah. pull from. Um, essentially, what I do is I say, what is a function? Like fundamentally, um, I'm looking for, you know, polynomials. I'm looking for the natural log. I'm looking for e to the x. I'm looking for um, sine x and cos x. Um, all of these are types of functions that we know how to work with. Mm -hmm. And if I see sine of x cubed, I see a polynomial within another function. So this is the sign of uh, a polynomial. And that's how I know I have something of the form x of g of f of g of x. That makes sense. So that is kind of how I approach it. I look for what are the functions that I know and how are they relating to one another? Gotcha. In this case, you are exactly right. You said I have a positive, or I have a, uh, <sighs> I have a uh, derivative of a composite function. I know I need to just apply the chain rule. Um, we're saying we're starting when x is equal to five. This is like not like language the way that they did that with the farm. That's like, I think they just want you to start with x is equal to five. That's my yeah. assumption. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's what I was going with. And then look yeah. at the, the graph of g first to plug it in. Yep. So when, this is g prime. Um, when g, what is g of five? Uh, g of five is, well, 20 minus 10. That's, it looks like it's one. G of five? Yeah. What, uh, am I looking at a derivative right now? No. Nope. So what is G of five? Is it 15? Yep. Oh, I was looking at the slope. Oh yep. gosh. You plug in five, you get 15. Now G prime of five is going to be 20 minus 10 over 0 minus 10, which is equal to 10 over 10, which is equal to, no, would be minus 2, not 2, minus 2, which I'm sure is what you were thinking of. Uh, I was thinking of minus 1 since negative 10 over, to me, negative 10 over negative 10 is negative 1. You're right. Um, it is minus 1. Um, and then uh, we don't need f. Um, we're going to need f prime. Um, but I'm going to set this up right now with what we already have. We have f prime times um, g of 5 times g prime of 5. So I'm basically just putting 5 in wherever I have x's in this function, right? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be minus one. Now I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to say I have f prime of not g of five because what is g of five equal to? Fifteen. Uh, yep. So I need to find f prime of fifteen. which is going to be uh, 20 minus 10 over, no, it's going to be 20 minus 15. When over, you're looking at, yeah, how do you figure? That's, I uh, don't understand. It's the slope of that line. Is it just right at 15 or since it's, so would it just be a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right of 15 that I would find? The thing slope? is, is that it's a line. Yeah. And so the slope is the same everywhere. Okay, so I can just take the slope of the entire line. Yep, of that whole chunk of line, as long as it's the same slope. 
so that's why I'm saying delta y over delta x is going to be uh, 20 minus 15 over 20 minus 10, which is going to be 5 over 10, which is going to be 1 half. All right. In this part, uh, that'll be what I think. 20, so the change in y, which is 20 minus 15, and then the change in x over that interval. So you're doing it from top to, okay, so it's the change, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, as long as it's 20. a positive number, you could do 15 minus 20 and 10 minus 20. Yeah. And then you would just get negative signs that would cancel out. Um, just keep track of your signs and you should be all good. Um, so this will turn out to be f prime of 15 is going to be 1 half, and that is going to be times negative 1. So my answer here is going to be negative 1 half. I have 19 unanswered questions. Thoughts, comments, and concerns? No, that makes um, perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. And then you had all of the pieces. Yeah. And compounded, because um, I, I know you have to go here, so I don't want to keep you. Um, compounded semi-annually, that's just, that's twice a year when I put it into the compounding annually formula. I believe so. Um, it's been a while since we've thought about interest. Um, compounding semi-annually is going to compound twice a year. Yeah. Which I think you wouldn't use your would you use your compounding or would you use your other interest formula for that? Well the only formulas that I have is annually and continuously. Yeah, so you're gonna use your annually function and it's going to, you're gonna change the time in there. Um what are those functions? Uh, the annually is P equals P naught, and then um, parentheses one plus R, close parentheses, to the T power. Okay. And then um, continuously is P equals P naught E to the RT. So you're not going to want to use this function. You're going to want to use this function, and you're going to want to alter the time. I don't know. That's not time. You're going to want to alter something else. It would be the rate because it's twice yeah. a year. So yeah. So it would have to be cut in half. Exactly. Yes. I'm just crazy. I'm sorry. No, it's OK. Um, Oh, I opened it right to the page. Continuously, um, it is going to affect the rate. But I don't think it's going to just double it or like have it. Something else is happening here. Um, oh. So I Googled it as one does when <laughs> they are under stress <laughs> um, and got P is equal to P naught is one plus R over N to the N T. And that's what we're missing. Where N 
is amount of compoundings per year. So in this case, n is equal to 1. So we just have r and t. But if we were to compound two times a year, like you said, so semi-annually, um, n is equal to 2. So we're going to end up with p is equal to p naught. Uh, uh, 1 plus r over 2 times 2t. Two And n is the amount compounded per year. Okay, so I had the wrong formulas completely. Um, this is like the formula that you had. The it's the annually formula. We just need to add more compoundings per year, and that doesn't just affect the rate, and it doesn't just affect the time. Mm -hmm. um, it affects both of them. Um, so that's why we added. This is basically just like, um, like big boy version of this formula. Gotcha. Because this formula is this formula, but if n is equal to 1. And they wouldn't give the formula on the test. You'd have to remember the formula. Yeah, which is really weird because they don't have that formula in the book, as far as I see right now. Yeah. That's why I was really confused. Um, yeah, so I'm not a huge fan of that. But uh, if you have to memorize the formula, memorize this one and know that annually just means that n is equal to 1. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. So annually is just one and then semi-annually would be two and so on. Yep. Okay, um, okay. And you can, yeah, you can Google um, compound interest formula um, and I think I found this on purplemath.com. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> Okie doke. Um, I do unfortunately have to dash now. Nope, understood. Um, I really hope that your exam goes well. Um, you, know, you know everything. It's just, you, you know, putting it together. Um, Pulling it out, yeah. Yeah. Um, but you definitely, you're, you're on top of this. Um, so I hope very much that it goes very well for you. Thank um, you. And that you have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. I appreciate your time. Have a good day. Yeah. Also, is your daughter, your daughter, it was doing okay? Yeah, she's, uh, it was no big deal. Apparently okay. it was made, I, I guess it was bigger than, well, it wasn't as big as I thought it was going to be. It did happen. She did fall, but somehow she broke with the Clydesdale that she was on, but somehow, I don't know, her fall got broken. The next day she was bouncing on a trampoline, so. Oh, good, okay. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, man, okay. Yeah, thank you for asking. I was of just, course. oh, God, I was such a mess. <laughs> yeah, that was really scary. Yeah, um, and she just bounced back like nothing. And I mean, the short for me, the internet, fact, I like she fell, but yeah, she yeah. was fine. Well, I'm oh. very glad, okay. Um, best wishes to her as well. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, so have a great weekend and a great night. All right, you too. Thank you very much. Bye.